Stanford University. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. Uh, my name is Lauren. I'm the CA for the course. Uh, Terry wasn't unable to make it today. Uh, since this is the last lecture, I'm going to cover a couple of logistics. If you are not taking the course for credit, you can just ignore what I'm about to say. But if you are taking the course for a unit, um, this is the last lecture, so after today, you should have attended at least 8 out of 10 of the lectures in person. And uh, you should have been signing the attendance sheets that's been passed around. But what you also need to do is by the end of finals week, which is next week, send an email to Terry. So his email address is winograd at cs.stanford.edu. All this information is also on the website if you want to just check that then as well. Um, and without further, further ado, um, this week we have another music-related talk. Um, uh, it's Jarek Kapusinski. Is, um, he had earned his degrees um, in the Chopin Academy of Music in Warsaw and did his doctoral degree in UC San Diego in composition and piano performance. Um, he also is a, he's an intermedia um, composer and performer. So he's performed all over the world in places from Paris to Madrid, New York, Tokyo. And now he's at the Stanford um, Department of Music. And to, today he's going to talk about sort of the interplay between sound and visu our visual perception and how sound can enhance visual perception and how together they can give more information than each of them individually. All right. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank for uh, the invitation to Terry Winograd. It's uh, nice to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you uh, what uh, my work is about. And uh, uh, thanks, Lauren, also for helping out, carrying stuff and everything. It was just really nice. Uh, so yeah, um, Lauren just said, I'm an intermedia artist, uh, uh, composer, and pianist. And uh, if I'm here, I guess, is because I use computers extensively. Uh, they're really important in my work. And uh, there are two main ways uh, how I use them. Uh, one is because computers mirror us uh, in being audiovisual. I am audiovisual. You can see me. <laughs> I'm talking to you. And uh, I am an audiovisual experience uh, to you. And uh, this is how we, uh, most of us, our lucky ones, uh, experience the world. Uh, it's practically strange that we have painting, which doesn't have sound, or music, which supposedly doesn't have image. Uh, it's somehow interesting about human beings that we have decided somehow to invent those things. Well, we are audiovisual. But uh, it's actually only now with computers that we have that unusual canvas, which actually mirrors that audiovisuality. And I believe that uh, having that ability of composing sounds and images on a single canvas uh, can lead to, uh, to new uh, kinds of expression because we can rebalance uh, what is said by the visuals and what is said by music, how they communicate with each other. And that uh, facility, uh, it's really easy now on a computer to play those things together and, and find new balances. Whereas, of course, we had the audiovisual traditions of, of dance, theater, um, but uh, it wasn't as easy as having that canvas uh, as we have the computer. So a computer is really important in my work for that purpose. And for the other purpose is to perform live. Because uh, uh, as you already heard, I'm a performer. I have a degree also as a pianist. And uh, as probably most of you have experienced this in your life, live performance, like live theater, live concerts, are really something special. <laughs> I, I treasure them. It's really something that I care about. and and. Um, so I think about the computer as something as as uh, as an instrument, something that I can use to perform live. Um, so I'll talk about both of these aspects, and uh, both of them are really part also of the research that I want to do now. I'm just newly hired here at Stanford. I started in September, and we started uh, an intermedia performance lab at uh, the music department in in Knoll Hall in uh, Karma, which you may know. Uh, that's the Center for Compu uh, Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. So there's a new lab there, which um, uh, I'm, I'm working hard on, on establishing, which uh, will probably uh, 
focus on at least those two issues that I want to talk about. Uh, so, let's start with the first one. Uh, what is so special about uh, rebalancing sound and image? Well, what, are, what are the potentials? What, how is it different from, from other kinds of uh, artistic work? Uh, so to do that, uh, I would like to play for you uh, an excerpt, uh, a three-minute excerpt from a piece of mine. Uh, it's actually a video that... Uh, um, uh, it's quite old, but I think it, it's a, a, the best uh, way to kind of introduce uh, the idea. So, uh, can I have like full screen instead of this? Uh, uh, full screen, maybe. Okay, yeah. So this is three minutes for a piece from a piece called Mondrian Variation. Here, I guess now we're very loud. Um, okay, anyone has any questions about this? I do. Yeah. Um, so, were the moments of color were those specifically chosen by you, or was it spontaneously from the computer? They were chosen by me. Yeah, they were chosen by. And me. the way the lines moved, it was. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I. Any any other questions? Because usually the question I get <laughs> is actually the one that I'm going to show. Uh, what, what's going on here? Okay. Um, yeah, usually the question that I get is which came first, image or sound? And, and um, 
and of course, the answer here is, and that's, that's I guess, the key uh, to, to uh, my work and, and uh, my enjoyment of computers, is that it's an unusual situation that uh, you can uh, theoretically work uh, sculpt audiovisually. You don't have to have first a musical score and then interpret it visually and create a ballet to an existing Stravinsky score. You don't have to have a movie and then write music for it. Uh, on a computer, you can use your imagination. And in fact, in, in the case of this piece, I still remember the place where I was standing and waiting for someone, and suddenly I saw this line from Mondrian coming with a bang. And I knew that, okay, this is my object, the object, an audiovisual object that, has, that I will going, I'm going to create uh, a piece with. So it's not, uh, it, the idea was not just visual or it was not just oral, it was an audiovisual object that I wanted to sculpt with in time. And of course, uh, computers are ideal for this. Uh, so uh, actually, probably I should say that it's neither or both. It's a question of, of um, composing out of audiovisual material. Now, uh, it doesn't have to be strictly as strict as this. It doesn't have to be that you are working with an audiovisual object. But I think that uh, uh, as, as I continued to work, my artistic premise became uh, to integrate things and be constantly aware of the potential of the other as I'm composing. So I don't allow myself to compose a full piece of music. Uh, I, I always, every, every motif, every five notes that I, that I write, I always need to know, okay, what will be the image? And this is important because the, there was research made, uh, for example, about the duration of a visual second and oral second. So one second of light and one second of audio do not last the same for, our, for us in perception. If, if I would present one second real, a true one second of light to you and one second of sound, uh, you won't feel that, we wouldn't feel that it's the same duration. And I'm absolutely convinced that research has, I'm not aware of that research, uh, that uh, for an audiovisual second, that would be probably a totally different one. I wonder which one would, that would be. I, I haven't tested this. But um, for sure, an audiovisual event uh, has a different expression, different weight perceptually and definitely expressively as well. So um, uh, any kind of combined audiovisual um, uh, elements, I'm sure, uh, generate new stuff. So to sum up, of course, this, all of this is about computers providing this unusual uh, uh, space where we can create new, uh, new balances of sound and image rather than uh, having one dominate or the other. And uh, I think that uh, once we have that, uh, let's be a little bit more specific. Okay, so the computer allows this. We can have whatever we want, whatever balance I want of, of sound and image. So what is the balance that I want? That's, that's the question. And of course, in general, uh, uh, if you think about arts, I think we can say that uh, most of it depends on um, conflict and resolution, on dissonance, consonance, on uh, 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 moments of uh, disharmony and going to harmony. And there is this, con at least in the arts that deal with time, usually they balance things in some way. Some, some art is mostly consonant and mostly harmonious. Some actually involves a lot of conflict. Uh, so these balances are different. But for sure, you need to have that spectrum of possibilities. And uh, this is something that I was curious to understand. What is what is that space audiovisually between uh, visuals and, and music? And um, I, I, uh, there's this uh, great book by Lawrence Marks, Unity of the Senses, where he quotes Aristotle, as, uh, Aristotle uh, listing common qualities, or uh, he actually called it uh, the common sensibles. I should have written common sensibles, not qualities. And these are between sound and image. So what I was looking for is first the balance, the, the, the harmony. Is it possible to find what kind of image would go with what kind of sound to have this feeling of fitting, that it's actually a link, that, it's, that feels right, that feels restful or, or harmonious? And uh, so this is, I guess, we can have similar sense of motion or rest in both. Uh, we can have similar sense of form. Um, size, intensity, brightness, number, 
unity, solidity. Obviously, uh, there are these. Uh, I, I re try to reorganize them a little bit uh, in a different way. Uh, it's to talk about internal uh, uh, structural ways of uh, combining them, so vertically in time, the way the textures work, uh, uh, or horizontally in time, so like in rhythm, how things progress in time. Uh, and qualitative, which stuff like brightness, for example, uh, uh, belong to the qualitative ones. These are all internal ones. They have nothing to do with this, any kind of story, any kind of narrative. You, without having any story, you can have a feeling of, of uh, um, cohesiveness, of belonging. Like even the piece that you just seen, the, the Modian variations, I'm sure that you feel that, yeah, somehow these uh, uh, sounds fit the image, they, they seem to be in, not only in sync in time, but they seem to be somehow in sync in their expression. Uh, they uh, reinforce each other, they create a common uh, expression. And, uh, so, and that has nothing to do with any kind of story, it's not a, any kind of narrative. Uh, of course, image and sound can have a narrative, common narrative. Uh, if you see an image of a, of a church and you see the sound of an organ, clearly it feels like yeah, this is the right uh, meeting of the two. So th that's where the external, the associative uh, or symbolic connections can be made. And um, uh, so for sure there are these two worlds of com combining the two. But I think I'm particularly fond of the internal one. I come from the world of music which doesn't deal with the same kind of narratives. Uh, I think I, I'm pretty fond of, of more abstract thinking or more poetic thinking. So I guess this, uh, the internal ones are the ones are, uh, that are of interest to me. And then I realized also that uh, once we have, once we have the, uh, the similarities, when we, once we have the restful, the harmonious, of course, then we can disbalance them, we can create uh, differences. Uh, we can have shapes or numbers that are not exactly the same. So you can actually see this, I mean hear this, but see this. And suddenly there is a game that you're playing. There is a sense of, okay, there's a tension that I'm creating between one and the other. And, and uh, that became of interest to me and in fact that space of communication between senses uh, I think can generate something new. Uh, it, it can there could be some kind of emergence happening. And I thought about uh, an interesting uh, or a practical way uh, to describe what's happening. Um, uh, coming from stereoscopy or seeing with two eyes, and this is something that kind of explains very well how, uh, what happens if you combine two things that are similar but different. And if you want to try with me, uh, please cover one of your eyes Okay, put a finger in front of you, okay, and now without moving the finger, just move the hand over f uh, to cover the other eye. Do you see where the finger is? Compare the two. They seem to be in completely two different spaces. Yet, of course, if you look at <laughs> with both eyes, what you see is, is a three-dimensional uh, 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 vis vi vision of, of the finger. And so there is a new dimension that appears when the brain combines two pieces of information that are similar but different. So it adds what's similar, it tells the brain that those two similar things, they are similar, so maybe they're about the same thing. <laughs> so they, the brain is informed, okay, I have to combine them. But then they are different, so the brain, I guess, tells you, okay, there is something else going on here. There is some, so something else emerge, emerges from the addition of the two. And of course the word for that is synergy. And uh, Buckminster Fuller comes in with his definition of synergy as an addition of two or more elements producing more than their sum. And um, I like that. I would love to work with synergy. So I look for these links like that, synergetic links between image and sound. And um, one thing that's really important is, uh, that helps, is when things happen at the same time. Just like, of course, when I'm looking at the finger, my left and right eye are looking at the finger at the same time. It, it helps. I think uh, I, I, we are somehow hardwired to connect things that happen at the same time. So sound and image that happens at the same time, uh, the brain has a tendency of trying to evaluate them, that they maybe belong and maybe one is an information about the other. 
So uh, the coincidence in time uh, matters. It probably doesn't have to be uh, immediate. It doesn't have to be at the same time because just as I showed to you this, they were also close by. So it, the kind of slight offset in time is still valid to create that communication. But, uh, uh, but definitely the issue of time is important that they are close by. So um, I guess this uh, sums up in a very short way uh, the kind of uh, uh, issues that I'm interested in dealing with the computer as my canvas. Okay? This allows me to test all these things very relatively easily and, and uh, so I'm grateful for having this thing here. Uh, but then, then of course I missed the life aspect. I, the Mondrian piece that you've seen was a video piece. It, it was, it's one f once for all, it has been sculpted and you know, sh can show it on TV and everything. And uh, it's, uh, I missed something about it. I missed the life aspect. I felt, no, oh, it's always the same. Uh, yeah. Not to mention that once you put it on TV, the sound is horrible and everything is, it's like, uh, so I felt that would be really great to work uh, in real time with live performance. And um, so what I want to do now is, uh, ah, okay, this is a link for, if, if uh, I, I, I uh, s kind of formulated some of the stuff that I just talked about uh, in an article that uh, if you're interested in, this is where you can find it. But, uh, so moving on now to the live aspect, uh, I want to talk uh, to you about uh, this piece, uh, Catch the Tiger for a Piano and Computer Projection. And um, unfortunately, we couldn't bring a piano with a full keyboard, so I cannot play for you the whole piece here. So I'll actually demonstrate some fragments of it once I've uh, uh, shown you the, the documentation of it. So you actually see the piece, unfortunately, as video, first, but then, then I'll talk about some, some parts that I can actually do on a synthesizer here. So let me play for you Catch the Tiger. Um, what, uh, what you want to know, just because of course this is, uh, uh, in this venue, this is what we are interested in. Uh, hold on, I need to get to my desktop. Okay, let's just quit this. Uh, catch the Tiger. Okay. Um, maybe I need to do this again. Okay, Tiger movie. Uh, nope. Uh, again. So what I want you to know about this um, is that uh, the piece does not start until I hit some notes. Uh, I, until I hit start on the computer or until I do some, something uh, uh, w with, with my fingers uh, as a pianist. So of course everything, in fact what you see, you, you, I'll, I'll explain how it works afterwards, but, uh, but uh, just uh, for your curiosity uh, right away, uh, if, if, you, what, when, if you listen and, and you are curious about it, then you will know that this is a played live. Uh, okay, so...
will catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. My mother says to pick the very best one, and you are not it. Eeny, meeny, mighty mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. My mother says to pick the very best one, and you are not it. Eeny, meeny, mighty mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. My mother says to pick the very best one, and you are not it. Eeny, meeny, mighty mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. My mother says to pick the very best one, and you are not it. Eeny, meeny, mighty mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. My mother says to pick the very best one. Any questions? So you talked about uh, consonants and dissonance in music and maybe in image too. So I'd say that music is highly consonant. Would you call that imagery consonant or dissonant or either? Hmm. I think it's, um, it's, it's hard to simplify everything just to a single word because even within music, I think there were moments that they were more dissonant. And so there, it's consonant in terms of tonal, maybe. That's, uh, that's uh, for sure. There's, 
a relatively a lot of uh, consonants uh, to, to other music. But I think that uh, y y there is definitely tension even in a simple phrase like, uh, what's, uh, do we have sound? We used to have sound. Mm -hmm. uh, can we, we used to have one just a moment ago. Anyways, uh, maybe we'll get some sound in a second. Uh, okay, let me, maybe that's, maybe that's my fault, sorry. Uh, that probably is my fault because, yeah, once I do this, yes. <laughs> so, this is actually a dissonance. Then the resolution of a leading tone. So even within the tonal system, there are, of course, dissonances and there are, of course, tensions. So I, I, I wouldn't simplify that the whole music is, in fact, consonant. For sure, there was a, a relatively, you know, in com comparison to maybe some of the 20th century music, avant-garde music, it was much more consonant. But it's not that it was a vo the void of dissonance. It's just I used it in a more traditional way. Uh, and I think that visually it's the same thing. There's, there are situations where, which are, which are uh, at times uh, uh, maybe uh, you're, not, you're a little bit lost what's going on and times when you feel, ah, it fell in place. So I guess uh, in, in both layers individually there could be consonance and dissonance. But then of course there is a question of whether they're in, in sync together and when, and when they fall together. And of course, particularly that last, I think, uh, one of the last sections, uh, one be before last, when, when we had the boy uh, saying, uh, uh, counting out, there are moments when things fall in place and moments when you kind of feel that they're out of sync. And, and so in that sense, I would say there's moment of dissonance and then consonance between the two. So I guess we can look individually in layers and then uh, in the same term of consonance, dissonance, uh, how they are put together. I don't know if that explains your question, but that's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, I guess the real question is, you know, the, the distance, like you said, in the music is traditional. You know, mm -hmm. it's traditional, but in, in a traditional sense. Just how you would apply the terminology, consonants and dissonance, mm -hmm. to visual. Um, I mean, that has kind of a long history, maybe, you know, in painting, for example. Yeah. Uh, but what, what, what would be your, your answer to this? I'm curious. Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, those terms yeah. visually because they are yes. musical terms. And so yeah. I, I think it's a good question. I mean, I guess, you know, the, I suppose the sort of basic traditional answer would be you know, cubism is the point where visual arts, you know, I mean, I heard one time it's that, that uh, painting is the most avant-garde art form because it's the free, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's kind of unrestrained. And so I would say that, you know, the sort of textbook explanation for that would be up until cubism, you know, there wasn't, there was only a limited amount of distance in the visual yeah. arts because blah, blah, blah. Um, but with cubism, they blew the whole yeah. thing wide open. But that's, yeah. that's kind of a traditional yeah. answer. Yeah, but I think it's, it's, a, it's an important one because it's a, we are familiar with the representational imagery from before and then suddenly you have your head cut in half and of course that creates a dissonance, a jarring thing. And here, of course, if I show you, uh, let me just uh, maybe make the image uh, correct. Yes, if I show you, sorry, this one. Um, this is dissonant in comparison to this. Okay. So uh, again, that's from one to another. It's uh, dissonance resolved. And, and uh, uh, in this case, it's because it's a piece of information, because these are numbers. So it's a very different thing. It's maybe not even visual. But I think that it's somewhat of a meaning issue also when it comes to uh, paintings that represent visually things and they were, were conform with how we see things. And then suddenly when they're a cubist, uh, it's, it's also uh, uh, our understanding of things. Uh, so. Yeah, but I, I think it's, it's really important and I definitely, uh, in de depending on circumstances, depending on the visual language that you work with, that dissonance can fall in different places. Uh, any other questions about this? Yes? Just maybe a personal comment. The mu music is playing piano is basically pleasant. The numbers, being an engineer, has some different meaning, but the two together somehow were haunting to me. Hmm. Meaning that it's all in a cross correlation, if you wish, even though there is no, well, except for the rules you just brought up. But I was just wondering how come I pick up on it when the, hmm. the music doesn't seem to have it, the numbers don't, although it's my bias. 
but some other combination. So when you put the, when you did the piece, what what, do we, what did you have in mind in terms of when you put the two together? Did you try to put something in in a correlation, if you wish, something in between that is not present in the the, audio, in the sound versus the pictures? Uh, you, you know, it's it's very hard. Uh, I I don't I don't have anything specific in mind that I would name in words. That's actually I guess the power of of. of yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and the interpretations it's like that. Like real stereo, yeah. if you wish. But yeah. Yeah. I, it is arbitrary. I, it is arbitrary for sure. You can do uh, ver various things with uh, with exactly the same thing. You know, my my, my interpretation of the uh, final section. Uh, I guess this would be. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that I actually can start from there, but I uh, know oh, it's actually this one. Uh, at the end, uh, yeah, well, it's it's actually I won't, I won't be able to catch it now, but uh, because I, it's out of out of context, this I cannot actually start here. But you know, this kind of music with this imagery, it's definitely a personal comment on what numbers are, and and you know, I could probably exactly with the same image do something like this, and it will mean something completely different. So for sure, it's a poetic license. I, I, I decided that this is what the numbers mean to me, particularly out of the context, uh, having, having the counting out before, uh, the tiger and all. Uh, that's how I decided to finish. But yes? So can you please describe what aspect of the relationship is spontaneous to the live performance? Are you using math? Yes. Yeah, are, yeah, are okay. the numbers being generated by the note? How come that last sequence was playing when you weren't playing music? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the way it works is that that I actually have a QuickTime movie with everything. Okay. So I have every every possible thing that you saw is just a frame on a QuickTime movie, and I trigger it uh, by uh, using the Mac software. I, probably some of you know uh, Mac's MSP software, uh, and the way it works is that every section remaps my keyboard. So for example, if I, uh, uh, oh, this, is, this is the introduction, and uh, actually we don't hear that, but uh, I'm not sure that actually, ah yeah, okay. So uh, at that point that note actually begins with the nine. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of strange for me with not having everything here. Uh, yeah, there are certain notes that, that generate uh, certain imagery. Uh, this one, of course, is actually a sequence of uh, just just by tr by pressing certain notes. I have a sequence of QuickTime that does the fade in and fade out. So it doesn't have to be a single frame. It could be a sequence of uh, from a QuickTime that, as you see, it doesn't continue until I actually played the correct note. Although no, only some notes react. So I'm not sure that actually did I play a note that actually started something. But if I do the whole thing, I'm not sure. Um, I'm actually missing. Uh, yeah, I won't, won't be able to do it. But I can do it in the next section. I can show you. So here, um, and in fact, th this is what, what I want to show you, is uh, how image uh, transforms, uh, just some parameters in sound can transform how you see what's going on. So uh, for example, I can play this section simply slowly. Okay, So I decided that I'm in the mood that day at the concert to play it like this. I'm not sure that that's valid. Okay, but I can decide, of course, clearly to. Okay, I'm actually after lots of coffee. Which one is the right one? Because there's, of course, like in theater, or whatever. There's light, right way. Not, not not only one way, but there is a way which is valid expressively. So of course, I usually when I perform it, I'm I'm placed like this with a piano, so that I can see it, so that I can actually feel the audiovisual weight of of time as it passes, uh, the pacing, which is the right audiovisual pacing. But in this case, since I have the way it's uh, it's done, is that at this point. Um, uh, certain notes here, of course, trigger the next frame, and I can play stuff like uh, I, I can do change the rhythm completely. So, and that's actually.
what's the interesting of the piece? But I can also do a different piece again. Just, the image is always the same. It's just, I, I'm just changing the music. And, and the interesting thing is, for example, if I just change the articulation to short notes, for example, I kind of feel that I'm actually looking at the image there that it would be interesting to have a contrast, a kind of dissonance between uh, the sharpness and shortness of music and the staying or the long duration of the image. So it's actually fun that one is short and the other one actually stays there. So there's some kind of contrast. So of course, this is what's great that using Max, I can experiment that way. This is, this is we're coming back to the idea of a computer as a tool for me, as a canvas. But it's a canvas also for, for, for live generation of audiovisual material so I can work with it. So it's really, uh, really interesting that way. But I want to point to something uh, different. Let's say with the same piece. I'm going to just change the dynamics or the emphasis that I give to my left hand and my right hand. And I am sure that you will suddenly switch what you're looking at. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure that with this equipment, but I hope that uh, uh, we'll be able to s hear the difference between my left and right hand. I'll try to do it very clearly. Uh, something's letting me start uh, over. Now I was emphasizing the left hand, so probably what you were watching was one, two, three, four, five going. Now if I emphasize my right hand, suddenly you'll care more about the one going back to one and then with that little trill. Because of course this is the karate movie thing, is that they only give you the sound of the front where the main characters uh, fight. Because if you hear the whole sound of the scene, you'll be completely lost and you wouldn't know where to look. So it's really the sound that cues you, because again, it's some, somehow playing with your brain, uh, to, which, which looks for those uh, moments of coincidence, and then you focus there. So, uh, so this is also something interesting, that just between the, the dynamics between left and right hand can change what you're going to look at. So I can manipulate you <laughs> as a performer that way by choosing what you're going to look at. So, um, of course, the interesting thing about this as an interface for, for performance is, is also that you can uh, remap constantly because uh, w within Max there's an object called score following, uh, a follower, it's called follow in fact, and it means that uh, there is a score uh, that I have written for this piece that the computer know of, knows of. So once I finish a certain section, it knows now to remap the whole keyboard. And it actually remaps all the time, in fact. With every note, it remaps. So if I, if I don't play the right note, it won't do anything. Well, follow is actually clever enough that it allows some mistakes. So I, it, it will adjust if I miss one note, it will still continue. Um, it was written in the object, so that's, uh, that's really nice. But, uh, but basically, my, my keyboard constantly changes. There's not a, it's not a single mapping that every time I play the note C, I'm gonna have the same frame. In fact, uh, here in this section, that's, the, that's from here, that's, that's the same C. The same C in the next one, uh, actually generates this. It's exactly the same note. But at this point, of course, in the, in the program, the whole remapping has changed. And, and uh, because the computer, now I'm, of course, uh, just jumping, leaping to the next section. But, uh, but uh, since the computer follows as I play, it would have gotten to this place where it, when it should be. Okay? So my interface basically reprograms itself all the time 
uh, uh, so that I can do what I want. And then it's actually my job as a composer simply to have an interesting match between an image and sound because in fact I can match anything with anything. I don't have that thing that uh, the, the, the color organ dream that C is red, D is blue, E is something and, and then you constantly have the same interpretation visually by mapping what you play to image. I can actually change what my mapping is constantly and and then it's really my job as a composer or as an audiovisual artist to understand what are the mappings the interesting mappings that i'm interested in that that i believe are expressive was that a question yeah when you say you can change the mapping mm -hmm. do you mean you on the piano keyboard or do you mean you back in time when you constructed the algorithm which determined how to change mapping? Yeah, yeah. This is this is uh, in time. It was done in advance. So so then then I actually perform it. I just know uh, you know this piece is uh, is very strict in the way that I don't allow myself any improvisation. But I have some other pieces where uh, where in fact there is uh, there are several notes that do different things, and I can choose which one I, I use. And after using them a, a few times, I switch to a new mapping. So so it could be dynamic in different ways. Uh, here it's actually note after note uh, the, the score is being followed uh, so only in fact it's always waiting just for one specific note on the keyboard to go to the next step. Uh, but but I, I have some pieces also where uh, where I can improvise. Uh, um, just for example, by by by, I have this uh, uh, installation piece that's that's open to the public, where where you can redance a dance. So you have a quick time movie of of, of a dancer. Uh, and uh, you can just <laughs> it's a very simple uh, effect, but uh, you advance in the movie by playing any on the any one of the white keys and you go back a frame with any of of, of the uh, black keys and of course then very easily you can do these kind of things you know with with a dancer just by doing between black and white key. So you don't have to know anything about playing the piano and you can suddenly re-dance and re-improvise the music and, and the dance. Uh, it's kind of an ex experimental piece that, that, that I decided to, to put once on an installation. So there, there's a whole spectrum of how much freedom you allow yourself in the, in the mapping. Uh, do you, it's, it really depends. And of course it can change section by section. Sections could be more impro improvisatory, improvi, yeah, well. You know what I mean. Yeah. But, uh, what I'm interested in is something like artistic decisions per second that you're making as a performer. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that music is a hit. You're making more musical decisions on stage than you are visual decisions. At this point, absolutely, yeah, because the image is fixed. Except for that example you just used where the installation piece where the yeah. audiences you could imagine you might have turned off the sound and they think that keyboard is just to control the dancer and they don't know anything about the sound aspect. Mm. and in that case there's more parity yeah. between the decisions yeah 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 it's That's true correct. yeah so so that balance can be uh, exactly i guess i'm we are coming back to the idea of rebalancing you can rebalance things more freely that way uh it's true that this piece has a fixed image in fact i did this originally i did this piece not as a live thing uh i i like the audiovisual relation between the two i played it with a click track so there is actually a, <laughs> a video running and i'm play, I, I used to play it just with a click track uh, uh but uh, then uh, a few years later once max was at at speed and everything i was able to do this uh, and i prefer to play the now live of course but still, it's, it's true that it's very simple that way, this, this one. Any other questions about this? Are you going to talk a little bit more about Max? Um, I'm not sure what... Uh, uh, Did you help develop it? Uh, Max? Yeah. No. No, okay. no, no. Max MSP was actually developed by my teacher. I, I, I studied with uh, Miller Pocket uh, at UC San Diego and uh, yeah. So uh, um, I'm not sure that that's uh, um, uh, of course maybe I, what I can do is simply uh, let's do this I can probably switch off this guy um, 
Uh, okay. And what we can do is... Um, Okay, yeah, so this is, uh, this basically will show you what's the, uh, what's the interface like, the, the way I perform it. Of course, this is just the front page, sort of, so that I don't have to deal with anything of what's underneath. Of course, this is what's underneath, and each one of these, uh, um, if I double click on each one of these, there is another patch that's underneath of these. And so these are the different sections. So basically uh, here I, I switch to every section just by clicking on one of these or by using one, two, three, four, five, six on my keyboard so I can switch to different sections. So this is how I access the piece. Basically there is audio. Uh, you probably remember that there were children playing and everything. So there is actually there are sound files uh, which I can uh, control the level here. Um, a movie player is the object which which allows me to, to just control the the video so uh there is uh i can show you here uh there is a movie called tiger video dot movie <laughs> which is that quick time movie and uh here of course i i place it in a certain spot uh, in this case it was on the right of my screen here and that was going to the projection so there are various controls here that you can have of the of the video um and uh, the, the, where is the follow object? Let me find the follow object because uh, each one, I think, yeah. You see, each of the sections has the follow tiger, in this case, follow tiger intro. That's, that's the intro section. So within that object, um, I have recorded the score of the introduction. And then uh, every note that I play, uh, sends out the number of that note from that collection. Since I recorded it, clearly there's a first note, second, third, and you know, there's a number of notes. And uh, every time the, the computer recognizes that I played one of those notes, it sends that number to um, uh, this object. And this object only reacts to note number one, three, six, eight, and so on. Okay, so, so it doesn't re react to every note that I play. That's why I can do all of this, but actually only this note moves something. So my musical gesture is free. I can do whatever I want. I just need to find that specific note that will do what, I, what will trigger my visual effect. So here only note 1, 3, 6, 8, 15, 17, 19, and 20 uh, move to a certain number of frame. In this case, you saw those frames counting down from uh, 9, 8, 7. Uh, but there was this moment of fade in, fade out, and that was here, I guess. Uh, select 8 or select 20. So at, at note number 8 and the lo no note number 20, there are other things happening, not just single frames shown, but there is something else that's triggered. So here you have select 8. At 8, after f 500 milliseconds, uh, uh, starting at frame three, 307, uh, the video resumes play. And after three seconds and 200 milliseconds, it stops play. So basically, I have three seconds of video actually playing straight from my source. So uh, yeah, so, so basically, each, each of those sections has some, uh, some way of dealing with that material. So particularly that, that last section, for example, where there are just uh, numbers scrolling, it's continuous video. I don't control anything at that point. Uh, it's, it just has its own slow uh, kind of fade, and I, I, I yeah, and I play play with it. There was no need at that point for for that kind of one-to-one -one relationship. So what about that part with the, uh, the child singing the song? Was that also played, or was there uh, was it being driven? That one, that one is also that that one is played. It, it, I mean, it's played. Uh, within sections and then it's free at other, uh, it, it has longer durations also where I actually don't control anything because there was, there, I wanted it to have a certain independent rhythm and you know there are also moments, uh, maybe I can even show you, uh, it's the same thing for example in this one, this section, um, can I actually uh, maybe instead of doing this, let me, because um, that's I think will be a good example. Um, okay, can we, are we back? Yeah, okay, so, um, of 
course, it goes on. In fact, what I do is I do this, which kind of I'm being a magician here. I'm cheating because, of course, this would actually go on. But I pretend that it's because I do this. But isn't art about magic somewhat? And then it's actually the left hand that will stop it at a certain point. Okay, so so that that's why there is. I, I mean. I don't like to use the word cheat because because it's but it's it's about magic. It's about not showing you how things are done, but but of course getting to the expression that you want. So yeah, you are there are some flexibilities there. Yes. So if you wanted to communicate a piece to, to another performer, how would you or how have you done it between demonstration, between examination of the score, and then some combination? Well, of course, uh, you, I, I would give I would give the the, the patch, and there is simply a score which I even have here. So if anyone reads music, I can show you. It's just it's just a plain musical score, and of course, what what I write, uh, I I don't even write a lot of information here because basically, if you play the notes, the piece will happen. The only thing is that if you practice it, you should practice it with visuals because it's it's that thing about timing, about the audiovisual expression. I think that I care about that. You need to kind of understand what are the right audiovisual tempi that you need to take to have the right pacing audiovisually. So, so for sure, uh, I would like the, my uh, possible performer to have that ability not just to learn the score, but to actually practice it as if, as if they were practicing their instruments, which is in this case, and it's audiovisual instruments. So you better practice the way you will perform it on stage. So uh, uh, I don't know if it answers your question, but. It's, it's basically just a traditional score, plus some annotations like, for example, if you want to start from page three, you just hit number four on the, on the computer and that's where you start. Uh, yeah? Two quick Max questions. Uh, every, can Max be driven by a MIDI file? Absolutely, yes. And can it control director movies? Uh, director movies? I probably, I would be surprised if, if no one created a plug to, to do that, yeah. Yeah. Do you find Max MSP to be a you know, sufficiently expressive environment? Look. Yeah, I, it, you know, I, I think... What would you like it to do that it couldn't do? Or would, what would be the ideal of your environment if you didn't have um, Well, yeah, it's, it's true that, that, in fact, part of my uh, PhD uh, dissertation, there was this, this whole article that I wrote, an imaginary software that I couldn't program myself because I'm not really a programmer to, to do this, uh, which would allow me to a little bit more flexibility, uh, uh, being able to move files. Uh, I, I guess some kind of mixture of, of uh, like Final Cut, Cut and After Effects and Max uh, would, be, would be great, where I could just pile files and play with them and, and make very fast association between certain frames or certain fragments. Uh, this is a little bit tedious when I have to give numbers and, and, and find number six and number this has to trigger that. It, it, takes, it takes a lot of time. It would be great if I could just point to a frame by, by dragging or something and, and immediately those kind of connection would happen. Yeah, I, I can see that. It looks like it's in, I mean, the patch, you know, I mean, it does an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 although I must tell you that, that once I knew what the piece was, and I knew it because the piece existed not as a computer form, but uh, for it, it took me probably a week to do this. Uh, so it's not, it wasn't that, uh, but of course it's composing that takes time, because it's not the computers, it's really this that, that's slow and, and demands work. Would you be happy with any other things that you just can't do because it would just be too tricky in a Max MSP if that's your main bridge, you know? Well, then, then actually, this is a good, a, a good, um, a good uh, segue, maybe to to kind of the final part of of, of not my my talk here. It's where I want the research to go, kind of, and as part of of the Intermedia Performance Lab. And in fact, uh, if anyone here uh, at Stanford is interested in joining in uh, or is interested in in the, some kind of similar issues, uh, please let me know, because uh, we we need. Um, manpower to do these kind of things and brain power and ideas um, 
Because for sure, in the intermediate performance lab, there are two things, just like exactly the same two uh, areas, I guess, of, of knowledge that, that need to be developed. One is really that understanding of, of what are the in, in, in possible interesting uh, intermediate relationships and correspondences. And, and, and how do we understand how they correlate and what makes them interesting and valid and expressive? And, and uh, so, uh, and, and this would be independent of performance or just, just as a, uh, the idea of counterpoint, the dissonance, consonance, how do you resolve them audiovisually, all, all of this is, is kind of uncharted territory uh, still. And uh, I, uh, even within the music department, uh, I talked with uh, Jesse Roden, who is uh, uh, in... Um, uh, who, whose expertise is actually uh, Renaissance counterpoint uh, to, to maybe even publish something or teach a course about intermedia counterpoint. Uh, because counterpoint is basically about how you get to a dissonance and how you resolve it. It's a huge simplification, but, uh, but in some ways it's how do you have that vertical presence of more than one part, how do you create a tension between them, how do you resolve them. And uh, so I believe that uh, you know, there, there's that area. And the other area is really just the development of tools uh, to uh, perform audiovisually. And there are two ways. One is kind of following on, on, on the uh, instrument uh, idea. And why, why do I care about the instruments is because I care about performance and I don't care about someone doing something like this, you know, and creating great and amazing visuals. Because it actually, it's not very expressive on stage. While if I see a pianist or a cellist or someone who, who transmits through, I guess, my knowledge of that instrument, that they are a virtuoso, that they are doing something really impressive, that they are doing something unique and precious, then of course it becomes more valid. So the idea of having instruments that are practiced for years, for hours per day, uh, as controllers, I think it's a valid thing, it's a valid approach. So finding ways, interesting ways of mapping, but mapping, I don't like the word because it's too one-to-one, -one, but, but creating uh, some kind of nice correspondence between the live instrument, musical instrument possibly, I'm a musician so that's the easiest way for me to think, but that's not the only possible thing. But instruments are known for their virtuosity, for, for, for complexity, but it's excessive, uh, accessible. We kind of understand what people are doing even if we cannot play that instrument. It's, it's transparent, that action, that virtuosity, that, that masterfulness is, is clear to us. So uh, on, on one hand, I think that I would like to continue doing these kind of works where music instruments are controlling audiovisual content. But on the other hand, I'm really interested in, in developing also new interfaces. And, and my dream at this point particularly is a big uh, multi-touch screen. A, a huge one. The one that, I mean, not huge one, but big enough that you could see me act on it. And if you could imagine uh, the Mondrian piece that you just see, that I would in fact just move those lines with my hands and cross them and make them break into a sound. And then at some point when they break, everything switches dynamically, just like I remap constantly my, my keyboard, I remap my interface there, and it turns into a Kandinsky piece where suddenly I pull on things, I squeeze them, I do other things to it to create a, a, a sound and image kind of uh, thing. And um, I think that it would be uh, interesting to have an instrument. I understand that looking at the cellist can be fun. Although I usually close my eyes because I, I care about the sound and I find it distracting and not particularly interesting to see a cellist. But if the cello was actually an interesting visual, <laughs> if you could actually see something interesting going on in, in your visuals uh, and, and this also being transformed all the time. Because of course we have already multi-touch uh, controllers and even you had uh, just last week uh, here uh, the React table or two weeks ago. Uh, but of course that's, uh, it, it's kind of a language, it's almost you're, you're watching a Mac patch, which is much more interesting visually of course. And I, I enjoy it, uh, what, what they do. But, but it doesn't change that much. It's not really a dynamic, visual, valid, expressive thing. Uh, in comparison to what I dream of. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so I think that uh, that having a, 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 and to do this, to do this kind of multitask thing, it requires some of you guys here in, in computer science knowing how to really program the, the multi-touch uh, screen. It requires um, collaboration with visual artists possibly to create really interesting visuals, uh, computer graphics people uh, who, who know how to do that on the computer, uh, maybe dancers to teach us about movement, what are the interesting and valid movements rather than this or this. What are the interesting movements suddenly when I can interact with the image? Uh, theater people, uh, it's, I'm really looking forward to establishing these connections with other departments here as part of that Intermedia Performance Lab to maybe understand those issues and then create that multi-touch uh, instrument of a size which is balanced with a human body. So not huge, not that I have to run, although that could be an interesting idea, I think. To have an interface where you actually have to run. Ha, ah, that's a good idea. Well, but anyways, the multi touch screens that are affordable are probably this size now, so we're not there yet, but maybe in a couple of months. Apple, where are you with your big multi touch? Um, one thing that I admire about uh, Golan Levin's work in yes. interactive, yeah, he's great. interactive uh, audio visuals is that um, there's a strict um, set of rules um, that are expressive enough and, and highly dimensional that. Um, that um, although people uninformed of the interface um, can 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 approach the instrument and play with it for hours and not get not get bored of uh, the rules that they that they slowly discover, but uh, it's intuitive enough for them to discover uh, what these what these rules are at the time. Um, but he's not a musician as well, mm -hmm. um, so by looking at these numbers, then we can see, I guess, um, more of the tonal relationships. <coughs> notes and nonsense. So um, is there sort of a uh, happy medium between these two? I think there are two approaches. I think you're right. One, one approach is, first of all, the accessible to everyone, something that you can learn right away and improvise with. So this is kind of in the vein of improvisation. And what I'm talking, of course, is more I'm not really into improvisation. What I'm thinking about is audiovisual pieces that can be performed by master users who have practice to do this. And uh, so these are kind of two different approaches. And uh, I think that both are valid. There seems to be pretty much a tendency now to go towards improvisation we are, because we are just developing new instruments. So we d really don't know what to do with them. And usually, because of technology going so fast, people don't spend a lot of time with them and they move to the next one. So they never learn it as much as they would learn a violin. So it usually stays at the level of improvisation, which in case of Golan Levin actually leads to some very good effects and very interesting stuff. Um, but I think that uh, it, it would be interesting to, uh, for, for me at least, as a musician, as someone who was probably educated in that tradition and, and having uh, uh, performed pieces and having that uh, uh, relationship with the public where actually I have practiced something for a long, long time to perform it for you, uh, to go that way as well. So there are probably two different uh, two different approaches in, in this sense. I don't know if this answers your question, but uh, uh, I, I guess there are, these are two. And you know, there, I think that there is, there is a problem uh, in, uh, in, in interactivity uh, that is, um, we appreciate things that are difficult. Think about climbing a mountain and the view that you see once you've spent two hours climbing it. And if you get there by car, it's nice and it's exciting. But do you care as much? I've, I always feel that somehow I get so thrilled when I actually climb it myself. I don't know why. It feels as if it was more beautiful. And I think that there is, uh, there is something to be said for things that require work. And, and we appreciate it in others who that, did that work for, for us as well. That's why we, I don't know if all of us, but I guess most of us probably love going to theater, going to concerts, where people do things for you that you cannot do. Uh, maybe you could if you spend the same amount of time and effort that they did to do it. So uh, I don't know, I guess this is, this is kind of my stand, stand on that. And I, I don't think it's in any way belittles, I hope, that it doesn't sound that it belittles the work of, of Golan Levin, whom I admire and I find that it's absolutely great. It's kind of, it's just, it's a different, different need, different public than, than I guess what, what I am really interested in. Although I would love to work with him to develop things together, that, that would be a great. Um, I was 
wondering if you have an opinion on the montage and intention. I mean, in some ways, this is kind of related to that question mm -hmm. because what you just said was that, I mean, way, the way I heard what you just said is that there's experts and there's, you know, people who just do stuff. And they're, they're not an accident, I think. They'd mm -hmm. rather watch an expert in anything, whether it's a piano or a scratching a turntable, who really knows how to do it versus maybe a machine that enables people to do things that they may not know how to do, but they can create interesting effects. Um, but, but the real question is just, uh, you know, montage is the idea if you put images after another, it creates a meaning. Yes. Cinema uses that in a very, very powerful yes. way. Um, and it seems to me like, um, you know, to, to bring together music and visual imagery together, um, is it serendipitous, or do you try to tell a story? Is it, you know, because an awful lot of art traditionally is all about a story. And the serendipitous quality is kind of the 20th century thing, you know, where art kind of stopped being something that a lot of people could make sense of. And, you know, it goes into this other realm of kind of experimentation and technicalness. So do you, do you picture using music and visuals linked as a way to really tell a story, or is it more of just a serendipity? Whatever comes up. Uh. It's, it's neither, it's, it's the third one, which is, I, I come from music, and I think it's, it's really uh, my pacing or my narrative comes from this kind of uh, uh, sensibility, uh, which is, music is such a strange thing, because it's, uh, it, it's completely abstract. I mean, it means nothing. I mean, what, what does this mean? Yet, I don't know, it's calming. It's, it actually, it relates to something absolutely basic, and, and so it's very real. It's, it relates to our emotions, which are very real. Maybe more than emotions. There's the number two here, because there are just two notes. It's shortness. It's, there are lots of qualities to it that suddenly relate to things that are real to us. Yet it's abstract. And I guess, so, so this is also uh, what I meant by, by the advantages of, of the computer as, uh, to be able to rebalance things, because I think that you can also rebalance that uh, uh, habit of thinking audiovisually in terms of storytelling. Uh, this, this, I'm looking forward really to think about audiovisual art as almost as a musical art. There's of course the term of visual music, but that very often is used for visual artists who like to have to create visuals and they don't really, some of them care, but a lot of them don't really even care what the music going underneath is. Uh, it's just that the visuals are completely free of storytelling uh, and they're just splendid and beautiful and emotional and, and color matters more than any kind of shape. Uh, I'm simplifying things. Um, uh, actually, this is not, not a fair representation. But, but visuals are, are really uh, disassociated from any kind of storytelling and then they call it visual music. Of course, for me, the interesting thing is always to have them both and have them communicate. I have a piece, um, for example, where I have the third element of text. And it's a piece called The Point Is. And visually, all you see is our individual points. They are called in a way. So I actually call them. I, I, I say uh, bright. And as I say bright, I actually play a certain motif in music. So every time I play a, no, a motif, I say a word, and I play one visual point. And, and it's almost like each one of them turns into a little haiku, where suddenly there is that interaction of three kinds of meaning that, that relate to kind of the same thing, which is how haikus are built. So, uh, and then it creates some kind of three-dimensional poetry, I guess. Uh, but you have to be extremely attentive. And it's funny because I realized that um, some of my audience, uh, they, for example, they are just so interested just in visuals, they find it boring because, of course, those points, they're interesting, which tells me that they were not listening, that they were not realizing that every time you saw that, you were supposed to, and that's, of course, my problem. You were supposed to hear and, and understand what it is. You weren't supposed to just look at it visually. So maybe my balance was not right. Uh, because, because somehow they were not pointed, because I think it's, it's the role of the artist to point you somehow to where the message is. So maybe my message was, was not uh, well pointed too, but, uh, but I, I think that, that this rebalancing can even happen with text, and text is extremely powerful in terms of storytelling. It's very, although you have poetry, and poetry can go 
on such wild abstract tangents uh, sometimes, as you know. Uh, we don't only have poetry which tells stories, we have poetry that can be very abstract. So uh, I guess abstraction and this kind of new uh, um, synergetic multidimensional interaction is, uh, or intermedia as I call it, is where I want to be. And I don't, I don't have the answers yet. I, I'm, I'm, that's, why, that's why we created the Intermedia Performance Lab and, and I want to look at uh, other people's ideas and, and see where it leads us. So it seems like you want to point at something, but you're not even sure quite what that means. Exactly. That of course, you know, some of my work shows you where, where I am, I guess, what's, what's, what, what is my interest, but, but I don't know that I understand what I do. <laughs> Any other questions? And I guess if not, thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.